Hi. Um, I'm battling a bad cold, so if I fall down, just pour some coffee in me and I should stand back up. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, bioacoustics. Now, I'm not uh, a bioacoustics expert, but I'm working uh, with an expert on a project, um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. It's very much a, a work in progress, so please bear that in mind. Um, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been doing with um, hold on one second. Uh, let me just refresh this. Uh, I think that's better. Let's try this. There we go. Um, specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, bark beetles. And uh, how many of you are familiar with bark beetles and what they do? Okay, a few. Um, there's a very... Uh, the mountain pine beetle is a causing a lot of problems in Western Canada, specifically in BC. And um, in this photo here, you can see, well, you can obviously see some healthy trees, but there's also a bunch of trees that are dead and then others that are dying. And this is because of the mountain pine beetle. Um, it's estimated that I think 53% uh, of the merchantable pine in BC will be destroyed by the mountain pine beetle by 2017. Um, it's causing billions of dollars of, in, of damage in addition to obviously wiping out vast swaths of, of forest. Um, so uh, this is Amanda Lindemann and she's uh, just finishing up her PhD in biology at Carleton and she has been studying bark beetles and specifically studying their, their acoustics and how they communicate, um, which isn't something that's terribly well understood. And so she had this idea to identify them by their chirps. And uh, so we were talking about this, and, and, and I volunteered to, to help out because it sounded like a fun project. Um, and specifically, this is just like a pilot project right now. Um, we're looking at three kinds of beetles. We're looking at the, well, the mountain pine beetle being one of them. Uh, this guy, the red turpentine beetle, which is actually what she's been um, focusing on. Um, this one is actually, in, in, in North America, not a real problem. Uh, but it was accidentally exported to China a few decades ago. And there it has been just causing havoc. Uh, wiped out something like 7 million trees or something. Uh, and it's because, depending on the environment and the ecology of where these beetles are, uh, they can be massively destructive or not. And that was partly why this um, study was initiated, because uh, being able to identify what species are, are where can be quite important, especially when you're looking at exporting. You don't want to cause a new, a new, academic, or a new epidemic. Um, here's another guy that it was, the third guy that's in this study is, is the Ips. Uh, the pine engraver beetle, and, and he's not generally as, as bad. He can cause problems, but not, not to the same scale that the others have done. Um, and Lois, he's also a different uh, genus. Um, these, other, well, these two are, are both in the same uh, genus. So um, just to give you a sense of the size of these guys, um, I, you can barely see them on that banana. They're, they're, they're teeny tiny. Um, and... Uh, so recording them is somewhat of a challenge. Uh, and so one thing that we, well, so anyway, sorry. Uh, getting ahead of myself here. Uh, when thinking about how to approach this problem, I thought, well, what's better than Python? I mean, uh, the number of libraries available are, 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 there's so many things that you can do with uh, obviously the whole uh, pandas and scikit-learn suite, but then there's also uh, this fantastic library called Librosa, which uh, was mentioned yesterday in the, uh, the Hockey Hack talk as well. It's a really great uh, acoustic library for, well, both music and, and audio analysis. Um, this is a chart, a Mel Power spectrogram produced with Librosa uh, of a uh, mountain pine beetle. It's about a minute and 17 seconds long. And I, the, it's lighter at the, well, the, the, the y-axis is, is hertz, so the, the frequency, and the, uh, the x-axis is time. 
and then the, it's color coded based on the like the amplitude, the, the the volume. So I'm not sure if you can see very well on this one, but there's a bunch of dark streaks in the darker band. Um, the reason that there's uh, that it gets white at the bottom is because it was passed through a a, a high pass filter. Um, Here's a kind of a zoomed in shot of about one second of this. And you can see the dark bands a little better here. Those are the chirps uh, for this beetle. So you can see there's five of them here. You can also see that they're very broad spectrum. They're not, they're not, uh, uh, they, they, uh, they cover a broad range of frequencies and that's because of the way the beetle produces the noise. It's not uh, like the way we produce sounds. It, it's done by, the, by rubbing, um, uh, an appendage across a, a surface. Um, so here's another way of looking at that same uh, recording, looking at purely the amplitude. And you, and you can see the chirps quite clearly in this one. This is quite a nice, clear recording. Uh, the problem is I, that, well, f that what I first identified as being important was isolating those chirps. Um, and so I used NumPy for that. And uh, was able to isolate them like like this, uh, so you can see I got rid of all the the <coughs> intermediate noise. Uh, however, each of these chirps themselves is composed of a bunch of pulses. This is zoomed in on um, a single chirp for first the mountain pine beetle, then the uh, red turpentine, and then the pine engraver at the bottom. And you can see that when you look at a single chirp. They are quite different in terms of how they present. And with one thing to note, it's the, the time scales here are not the same. The one at the bottom is, is uh, 45 milliseconds or something, whereas the ones at the top are much shorter uh, in the realm of less than 20 milliseconds. So uh, what, what did we find? Um, uh, like I said, this was an, a very initial study. So, But you can see some separation here. This, this is just like a look at, at some of the features that, that, that I was focusing on. And you can see the, you know, the, three, the three are starting to come apart there. And so far, uh, the best, uh, the, best uh, <laughs> the best examples I've had have been in the range of the mid to high 80s in terms of accuracy on the test set. Um, so, I'm working on improving that and improving uh, the feature extraction, which is really th the toughest part of this whole um, endeavor. Uh, again, because they are so small that the recordings are, have a lot of noise normally, and uh, isolating the chirps is, is uh, non-trivial in, in a lot of cases. So uh, that is about all I had to tell you, and um, thank you very much.